record this. So we are recording this program and I've started the recording. So my name is Suzanne Bontempo. I am the program manager for Our Water, Our World. And today's program is in partnership with the Alameda County Clean Water Program. Uh, I've been working in the garden industry professionally for well over 20 years, working uh, with landscape contractors, um, uh, garden maintenance teams, uh, retail nursery management, and now I'm strictly working as an integrated pest management educator, providing education around um, less toxic pest problem solving and how to grow healthy and happy gardens. And uh, this afternoon, I'm really honored to be able to uh, share some great uh, tips and techniques that we practice to help you have a healthy and happy garden and a healthy and happy home that is pest free. And this afternoon, Charlotte Canner is going to be joining me as my wonderful assistant. And Charlotte, would you like to say a couple of things about yourself? Sure, thanks Suzanne. Um, my name is Charlotte Canner. I uh, work as an IPM educator and advocate in the Bay Area, have been for about a year. Um, and I also am a garden educator at the Garden for the Environment in San Francisco. Um, I live in San Francisco, see, hence the uh, Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> behind me <laughs> representing. Um, and in addition to IPM, I'm also very passionate about soil health, uh, compost, and carbon sequestration. And I try to use that passion um, and channel it into work as a uh, garden, um, as a maintenance gardener in San Francisco as well. Thank you so much, Charlotte. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you're ready. We're gonna learn a lot in a very short amount of time. So our agenda for our time together is that I'm gonna be going through slides for about an hour. I'm gonna be covering best practices, and then I will be leaving about 30 minutes for uh, questions and answers at the end. I will be pausing a couple of times throughout the program to also allow for, uh, questions, a few questions to be asked, uh, and then we'll be uh, focusing and spending a lot of time at the end. So please jot down your questions. Feel free to write them into the Q&A as we go along. Uh, Charlotte's going to be helping me uh, address those questions as we go. And uh, what we are going to learn today are the principles of how to garden less toxically, specifically for this time of the year. And then why working with an integrated pest management approach means less pest problems. And then how your garden is a dynamic ecosystem. And we're going to be focusing on management tips for ants, rats, gophers, raccoons, and snails. Now, I'm not limited to that. If you've got other pest questions or pest problems you'd like to ask questions about, please do. But before we get started, I have drafted a couple questions I'm really curious about how you will answer. So, uh, Charlotte, will you present the poll? Now, this is three simple questions. If you don't mind going through, Number one, is it more effective to treat an ant infestation with a bait station rather than a spray? Yes or no. Uh, then the next question is, what time of the year is the best time to add new plants to your garden? And then the last question is asking, when we apply okay. pesticides, eco-friendly ones of course, what time of the day is the best time to apply them? So take a couple seconds to answer these questions because we are going to learn the answers to these. All right, I see people, I love this. This is my favorite part of the program, by the way. So that means there's really people out there. <laughs> I do miss the in-person uh, programs, but these new virtual programs are fun. Okay, looking good, everyone. Why don't we just take another 15 seconds. Another 10 seconds. All right, almost everyone, we have a few more people left.
Okay, we're still. All right, let's take five more seconds. What do you think, Charlotte? Mm, five more people <laughs> to vote. I know. We're getting close. I love it. Looks great. Okay. I think we're good. They're ready. Everyone's ready? Yeah, let's see what everyone has to say. All right. So question number one, 85 of you said yes, and 15% said no. Uh, what time of the year is the best time to add new plants? Uh, 48 of you said spring, 41 said fall, and 11 said winter. And uh, when we apply a pesticide, wow, this was close. 52 said early in the morning, and 41 said late at the end of the day, and 7% said any time. So uh, I'm going to start by giving everyone the answer to number one, and we're going to learn the answers to the other two questions in the middle of the program. So it is more effective to treat an ant infestation with a bait station rather than a spray. So for all of you that answered yes, yay. The reason why is because most liquid pesticides are contact kills, specifically the ones we're going to use for ants, all those ant sprays that we might find in the pesticide aisle even the eco-friendly ones, they're contact kills. And so we're only gonna kill what is present. Whereas the bait station, take the bait back to the colony, they feed everybody, and then it does a pretty darn good job of killing off the entire uh, colony. Thing with the sprays, when we do need to use a pesticide, it's important to always work with an eco-friendly one. And the reason why, if we have ants coming in the kitchen and we've sprayed uh, ant spray that isn't eco-friendly, the residuals of that pesticide are going to linger. And the next time we wash that floor or we wash down the countertop or we sprayed the pesticide, and then we have that uh, pesticide is now on the mop or on the sponge and we're rinsing it in the sink. Well, guess what? Those pesticides are going into the sink and going to the treatment plants. And sadly at the treatment plants, they're not being removed. So it is not only more effective to treat an ant infestation with a bait station, uh, it's going to manage your problem with a lot of success, but it's also not going to uh, be a problem for our waterways. So excellent job. Stay tuned for the answers to the next two questions as we move forward. So. Let's get started. Keeping your home and garden healthy throughout the fall and winter seasons. How do we accomplish this? We want to continue to maintain a healthy garden. So even though the seasons are changing, we can still do some very uh, important tasks in the garden that are going to keep the garden healthy and reduce pest problems. We're going to remember to adjust irrigation schedules for shorter days, and we're going to learn about how to prevent some of the common pest problems as the ones I mentioned in the previous screen. So before we really jump into uh, the fun part of the program, I just wanted to uh, introduce you to the Our Water, Our World program, since Charlotte and I both uh, work with this program as IPM educators. IPM means Integrated Pest Management. And this is a program that partners with retailers. So those of you uh, in the Bay Area, in the greater Bay Area, Northern California, you might recognize seeing these materials in your local hardware store, local nursery, local home improvement. And these are actually materials that are uh, designed to help you uh, make uh, really good, solid, eco-friendly decisions that are going to be effective, that are going to help you manage your pest problem for long-term success. So you'll see the this literature rack that's in the photo on the left has these fact sheets. These are actually one sheets that are designed for you to uh, take with you, to read, to learn how to solve some of these problems. And you can also find these on our website. So for those of you that have not seen these in the store, please go and check out the Our Water Our World website to access them. There's a lot of really wonderful information there. And then of course, at a lot of our retailers that we partner with, you'll see these little blue tags called shelf talkers that are lined up with the pesticide or the product that indicates that yes, this is less toxic but effective. So 
integrated pest management, I've mentioned it a couple times right now. Uh, it's actually a, it's a decision making process. It allows us to look at the system as a whole. That system could be your house, your garden. Um, and the way I like to really share is that it's just common sense. It's how we kind of manage these problems in a really smart, sustainable way. We want to identify what the problem is. And uh, unfortunately, oftentimes what we're looking at are symptoms of another problem. So those ants coming the house, that's a real nuisance. But the real problem is, is that there was a crack or a crevice that those ants could find their way into our house. Or maybe there was food that was left out and that's what's attracting them. So when we can find how their point of entry is and, and plug that up with maybe a fresh feed of caulk or um, some plaster or whatever material it is that you'd like to use and remove those food sources, clean up those crumbs, then we're solving the problem. Um, from there, we want to uh, identify when we see a pest problem, is it something that we can live with? Do we need to take action straight away? And if we do need to take action, we're going to use a combination of uh, methods such as cultural controls, mechanical controls, biological controls, and then chemical, chemical controls, which are the pesticides. And we always would use these as a last resort and always the least toxic possible. And if it's a plant that is always a problem, if it's a plant that always gets black spot, if it's a plant that's never really thrived the way we expected, instead of trying to uh, make that plant uh, perform the way we want to, just consider removing it. Give yourself permission to remove that plant. I know it's not easy. We get very attached to our plants in the garden, but it's okay. So uh, what uh, a visual that I like to share is uh, this illustration um, that I've had for a while, which really also speaks to integrated pest management. And it's uh, first becoming familiar with the environment. So we become familiar with the ho our house. We Come familiar with our garden and we're looking and we're noticing seasons and when buds are about to uh, break with flower or when leaves are falling and turning color and dropping for the winter season but then we also might notice when there is a pest problem and at that point we are going to evaluate and see uh, is this pest problem something we need to actually take some action we can work with preventative means and uh, we can then um, take an action and then we can monitor and see if that action worked, if we need to take further action or if we need to, uh, if we've managed the problem and then when we might need to start the cycle over. But the key here is prevention. So uh, the foundation to integrated pest management or less toxic pest problem solving, I would say is prevention. So what I'd like to ask is what does prevention look like to you? What are some tools that we can use to prevent issues, prevent problems from occurring? Timing of management action is also really important. Uh, when we take time uh, to manage that pest problem, so in the case of ants, if I've got a couple scouts coming in, I wanna clean them up straight away. I don't want the problem to be full blown um, if I can avoid it. Uh, it's inevitable this time of year that that problem does become full blown. So, but you know, then we could put the bait station out. And then of course, watering and fertilizing management. And what this means is oftentimes we have a tendency to overwater our plants and we have a tendency to overdo it with the synthetic fertilizers uh, or not fertilize enough with the organic fertilizers. So I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. And then sanitation, cleaning up the garden is really important. And we're going to dive into that. So pet, proper pest identifi identification is key. I want to share that pests can be insects, uh, it, they can be weeds, you know, plants that are not desirable, that are in the way, that are causing a nuisance. Uh, pests can also be uh, diseases. So it's really important. I just got uh, an email the other day from a customer, a client, say, asking what... Um, a particular pest was she thought it was a disease but it was actually white fly because the white fly um, the evidence of the white fly is very unusual very suspicious and it looked like it could be powdery mildew or some type of fungal problem so identifying the pest is really really important and not always easy understanding the life cycle of that uh, pest so uh, we know that once the rains start the weeds are going to start to come up so really be, be prepared for when the rainy season 
solution comes, maybe doing some preventative means like laying out sheet mulch to prevent those weeds from growing once the rains start. Understanding the pest habitat and the timing of that pest. And then understand also that when we see um, pests or bugs in the garden that we think might be pests, it's a good chance they could be beneficial because 90% of the bugs in the garden are actually good bugs eating bad bugs. So really important to know what we're up against. So a couple online resources I'd like to share is, of course, the Our Water, Our World uh, website, which where I've mentioned have those beautiful uh, uh, library of fact sheets. There's also uh, a product list that you can access that has a list of all of the less toxic products available uh, in the retail environment. And then there's also a really cool uh, uh, feature that is Ask Our Expert. You click on that, it goes to an email uh, platform where you can send an email, send your question via email to Burke, the Bio Integral Research Center in the East Bay, and you'll get your answer within 24 hours, Monday through Friday. There's a team of entomologists there that are ready to answer your question. It's pretty cool. And then of course the UCI PM website, I can't say enough about it. You know, here in California, we live in a Mediterranean climate. And so it's really important when we're doing any type of uh, pest ID and problem solving to uh, do our research to find answers on a website that's going to be relevant and address pest problems in our climate, which is Mediterranean, which is what the UCI PM website does. Now, we might find articles on the uh, web, um, on the internet from like Purdue or Cornell, but understand they are not in the same climate. So the way they manage the pest problems are going to be slightly dim different since they get summer rains and we don't. So please check these two websites out. So. Did you know that when we increase the health of our garden, we're actually reducing pest problems? It is that connected. It is, uh, it's, and it's also that simple. So healthy gardens means healthy plants means less pest problems. And how we do that is by continuing to keep the soil and the plants healthy. We want to amend our soil with really good quality compost. And when we can find compost tea, uh, I know that Linkso in San Carlos sells it, and um, I'm not sure if American Soil uh, sells it. I'm not sure who else in the East Bay might sell compost tea. It's not easy to find. But when we can find good quality, live, active compost tea, easy way to inoculate our gardens with uh, uh, really wonderful um, health. When we're planting plants, we want to amend the soil with compost. Uh, compost is going to improve the soil structure. So for that clay, for that rocky soil, for that sandy soil, we are going to uh, uh, amend the soil with compost. It's going to improve um, and enrich in any structure that we might be faced with. And then we also understand that compost is filled with so much microbiology that it really is increasing the health of the soil and the plants when we add it to our existing soil. Uh, compost also is going to increase water holding capacity. Um, and, and that's just a few things. There's so uh, many benefits when we're adding good quality compost to our soil. Throughout the uh, season, after we have plants already established, as opposed to working compost into the soil, sometimes it's advised just to lay a nice uh, a one to three inch layer of compost on top of the soil, not next to the plants, but just on top of the soil around where the root zones are with mulch on top. And that's another way to take advantage of the benefits of compost. Um, the reason why compost is so amazing is because of the beneficial uh, bacteria and fungi that it is loaded up with. Uh, this beneficial uh, bacteria and beneficial fungi are key for breaking down organic matter, uh, de the decomposition process, storing nutrients in the soil, breaking down toxins and pollutants, and holding the soil together. Uh, we also would like to, uh, I'd like to encourage you all, if you're not already, please work with organic fertilizers. Uh, sometimes people think they're more expensive, but uh, over time, they're not. We are actually using less 
product than we would with synthetics. Uh, understand that synthetic fertilizers are uh, high in salts and with that, typically over time are going to be detrimental to our soils. And also understand that synthetic soils act like steroids for plants. They are going to uh, push uh, and stimulate a lot of new growth. And what happens is, is that though those plants might look stunning after we've applied this fertilizer, uh, that new growth is loaded up with tender, soft uh, tissue that's loaded up with plant sugars. And what likes soft, tender, new growth loaded plant sugars? Pest insects. So that's where we see uh, that the bugs, like our aphids, our um, chewing insects, our weevils, um, our thrips, they're all on the new growth of our plants. And so when we're using the synthetic fertilizers, we're actually inviting those pest insects to come and have at it, where when we're working with organic fertilizers, we're actually feeding the soil, which is then in turn feeding the root systems, which then in turn is feeding our plants at a slower, more natural rate. We also know that synthetic fertilizers are not going to get into our local waterways and be a problem. Um, we, it's very difficult, if, if, if impossible, to burn your plants if you overdo it with organic fertilizers. Um, and um, yeah, what else can I say about it? It's just organic fertilizers are the way. We also want to take advantage of mulch. So mulch is one of those things that we can always apply to our soil that is just going to be a win-win. It reduces the water evaporation rate significantly, which means we don't have to water as often. It's going to protect the soil. Uh, it's going to keep the soil cool in the summer and warm in the winter. As it breaks down, as it decomposes over time, it's actually feeding the soil. And uh, let's say it um, is going to help reduce erosion. It's going to help retain moisture. It uh, creates habitat for our beneficial insects. Uh, but the key, again, is that we don't want it to be around the crown of the plant. So where the trunk and the root system meet, we want to make sure that's always clear. We really want to focus the mulch around uh, to be on top of the soil about a few inches to about a foot out from the crown of the plant. And the chunky mulch, the big chunky pieces kind of shown in this picture, they actually work really great as a barrier to prevent slugs and snails. They're not able to cross that chunky mulch. So everyone, here's the answer to question number two. Fall is for planting. Not to say you can't plant during the rest of the year, even the winter. However, the reason why fall is the best time of the year to plant is because we are getting shorter daylight hours. The temperatures are typically cooler. We still might have some heat spurts throughout the day, but overall the temperatures are cooling off. And if we are planting right now, we have a good solid six to nine months before next summer, when the heat of next summer really comes on. And during this time, our plants are able to really become established. The other cool thing is, is that hopefully we're going to get some rains. And with the rains, root systems will also be able to become established. Now, if we don't get rains, we still need to water our plants. It does take a while for plants to become established. So uh, we're going to talk about irrigation systems in a minute. But uh, this is absolutely the best time of the year to plant, so please take advantage of that. And you might ask which plants are best for my garden. Well, we're always going to choose California natives or Mediterranean native plants. Uh, the reason why is because they adapt to our climate. Now, something to keep in mind is not all California and Mediterranean native plants have the same water needs. Not all uh, plants uh, natives are low water. So such as redwoods, redwoods actually we would consider them moderate to high water users. So uh, keep in mind when we're uh, selecting plants that we're plant, we're going to select plants that are going to adapt to also the water zones that we might have already established. Matching those plants to the conditions of the garden, keeping them uh, from being stressed and su susceptible to other pests. 
Uh, choose, we can also choose pest and disease resistant varieties nowadays. There's so many wonderful plants at our local garden centers that will adapt extremely well to our gardens. A couple resources that I love to share if you're not already familiar with Basqua. Basqua is the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. They have this amazing library of uh, low and moderate water use plants, so have a look at that. Of course, I always love to reference the California Native Plant Society, and they have an East Bay chapter, so check them out. And then, of course, the Alameda County Master Gardeners, they have a water-wise plant list, so have a look at that as well. These are all going to be plant lists that are going to be suitable for our growing conditions here in the Bay Area. And Alameda County is pretty diverse goes all the way from the Bay out to Livermore. So a lot of different microclimates within one county. When we plant, we want to make sure we're uh, planting in the hydrozones. We're going to group plants with similar irrigation needs. Uh, we're going to also plant plants together with similar microclimate needs, such as sun, shade, wind, and heat. So keep that in mind when you're making your plant selection, that you have an idea where that plant's gonna go and that it's gonna be appropriately grouped with the other plants in that area of your garden. Our drip system. So hopefully everyone here is working with drip systems or have some type of drip irrigation system uh, set up. If you do, can you just raise your hand? I'd love to see how many of you have a drip irrigation system set up at your garden. Awesome. I love it. That is great. Yeah. So this is actually the most effective way to manage, uh, to, to effectively water our gardens is with drip. If you don't, please consider please consider it. Right now, there are some amazing rebates on the smart controllers, the Ratio smart controller. It's an amazing uh, rebate that the county is offering. Check it out. It's uh, bayareagardening.org. You can get a lot of information on different water-saving uh, rebates for, well, actually indoors and outdoors. But uh, drip systems are amazing because they allow us to effectively uh, water our garden in a very localized way that we can also set the, the irrigation clocks for nice, deep, even watering throughout the area. The, uh, when we're working with drip, it's making um, direct contact with the soil, so it's less evaporation rate, uh, specifically when we have mulch on top of those emitters and on top of the, the drip um, irrigation tubing. It's going to really protect that. We can set the clocks for early in the morning when the air and soil are cool. The ideal times to have your irrigation clock set is really that 2 a.m. to about 6 a.m. time. Um, Sometimes I'll push it from about five to seven, but ideally it's going to be, you know, those early morning hours. And we can also set the clocks for multiple start times. For, so for those of you that have clay and you find that the water just doesn't percolate into the soil, you could set your clocks for multiple start times so that you can have water come out at different stages. So we have the water come on and we will have it uh, timed for until it starts to pool and then we have the clock go off. So let's say that might be five minutes. So we can set multiple five minute um, cycles so that we are able to really provide the plants with adequate enough water during um, shorter amount of times. So what I like to show you, I love this illustration. I'm a huge fan of root systems of plants. Um, it's kind of weird, but I love it. It's not easy to see what's going on below the soil. So I thought that this illustration would be really great. So we really want to encourage root, uh, deep root systems. And what I'd like to share is that for perennials, perennials are plants that have a two year life cycle or longer. It could take uh, a year, to uh, almost two years for that plant to become established. For trees, it could take up to five years for those plants to become established, and shrubs would be anything in between. So during that time when it, uh, that we're establishing our plants, we want to uh, encourage nice deep root systems, and how do we do that is by watering. 
roots are only going to go where the water goes. So if we're watering shallowly, we're going to have shallow root systems. And when we have shallow root systems and we happen to have excessive heat, that water evaporates really fast and then those plants are stressed. Not all plants show wilt when they're stressed, you know? So that's something that's a little challenging to manage, especially trees, established trees. Uh, so we want to encourage as these plants become established by watering deeper and less often. So at the beginning, when the plants have a small pot that they've come in and they have a small root system, we're gonna be watering more shallowly, more frequently, because this is the size of the root ball. But over time, we're going to encourage roots to go out and down, out and down, and that's where we're always going to focus the water. And this illustration from the Vacaville Tree Foundation, hopefully, uh, illustrates what I'm trying to share is that though this is a tree this could also be a perennial or a shrub this is the aerial uh, view and the blue ring is where we want to focus the water you see all those root hairs so the root hairs are going to grow beyond the plant and sometimes I like to share with folks just the edge of the plant so the drip line of the plant so if we've got a salvia for instance we're just going to water out here right at the edge of where that salvia is, or a rose, out where the outer extensions of that rose, or that budlia, um, and so forth. And over time, we're able to encourage, you know, the, the roots to grow out and down with the amount of water we give. We want to avoid watering at the crown. When we have water focused at the crown, again, like closer to the trunk or the main branches and stems of the plant, we can encourage crown rot, which is quite detrimental to our plants. And also over time, we want to remember to add emitters and increase the, the circumference, that radius. So we want to make sure we're bringing that out so there's nice even water all the way around the plants. Uh, something really cool I can share is since we are about to start rainy season, which we're all hoping for, uh, that one inch of water over a thousand square foot surface, you can capture over 600 gallons of water. So that could be, that thousand square foot surface could be your the roof of your garage or the roof of your house, um, a back studio, things like that. And uh, the photo, I do know that there are some rebates for rain barrels, so check those out. The photo on the left, of course, is just your standard 50 or 55 gallon rain barrel. That's wonderful. It's going to capture some water and then it's going to overflow because one inch of rain over a thousand square feet is well over 50 gallons. So I just like to introduce you to these new concepts in urban environments of these cisterns, these larger range ca rain catchment uh, um, holding uh, tanks. So these are going to be, they're designed now for uh, urban residents where they're narrow, they fit maybe on the side of the house, they don't take as much space, but they can still hold a substantial amount of water. Check this out. Uh, you can find more information at your local uh, landscape supply or local irrigation supply store. It's really cool. And here's some information. Here is a resource you can look up for more information on the rebates available throughout Alameda County. Go to the Alameda County Water District. So this is going to be your go-to to get more information on everything that's available for you. So again, that's Alameda County Water District. All right, any questions? What do we got, Charlotte? Anyone have any questions for us yet? I'm encouraged more uh, questions. Please send them to me in the Q&A. Um, I did see one question come through. Um, Andrea wanted to you to elaborate a little bit on sheet mulching. Oh, super. There is a slide coming up on sheet mulching, so you'll actually see um, a little um, mock-up, but uh, it's essentially layering cardboard so all those Amazon boxes and Chewy boxes that have been coming to your door, guess what? We can put them in the garden, layer them so that the edges are overlapping about six or eight inches. And then we are going to water that cardboard. And then we are going to layer no less than three inches of mulch on top. 
you can have a combination of like maybe an inch of compost, two inches of mulch, uh, two inches of compost, two inches of mulch. Really, you want no less than uh, three inches. And uh, with that, I always highly recommend no less than two inches of the mulch on the top part. You can also put an inch of compost underneath, cardboard, three inches of mulch on top. Just consider uh, a lasagna. Think of a lasagna. There's a lot of different ways to build a lasagna. It's always delicious. So, uh, but the key here is that we are layering the cardboard and it can go straight on top of the weeds. It can go straight on top of the turf. We do not need to uh, remove any of these. And over time, the beautiful biology in the soil comes alive. It starts to decompose those weeds, it starts to decompose that cardboard, and it really makes beautiful uh, plantable soil. So there you have it. All right. Should we Thank keep you. Going? We got a couple more that oh, came in, actually. Um, Carol's asking, what about mosquitoes and rain barrels? Great question, Carol. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, well, though the rain barrels and those cisterns are uh, set up to have a screen, the screens don't always uh, fit properly. Sometimes they fall off. Uh, so there is, you know, the potential for having a mosquito issue, right? So the good news is, is that there's products on the market. These uh, products are called um, mosquito dunks, mosquito plunks, mosquito bits, um, thereby um, Summit and Bonide. I think Summit and Bonide are the main um, brands, but you'll see them at um, any hardware store, any home improvement, any garden center. Everybody sells them. And it's a beneficial bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. Don't need to get hung up on that, but it is a beneficial bacteria that is specific for uh, mosquito larva. We put it in the water. It's not toxic to the water. It's not going to poison the water. Uh, but the larva of the mosquitoes feed off of it and it kills them off. So uh, it is safe. We can then water our plants with that water. We can have, um, if it's a trough, Horses can drink from that water. Dogs can drink from that water. Children can play and splash. They're not going to be uh, affected by this. This is not a poison. It is a very narrow spectrum and specifically just kills the larva of the mosquitoes. And you can get more information on the mosquitoes fact sheet that you can find on the Our Water, Our World website. And um, yeah, I'm not sure. Since the chat's not working, I would suggest that maybe, I don't know, Charlotte, Anyway, doesn't matter. I we think can, I, can, um, I can send it in the chat, I believe. Okay. I'll try. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> okay. Um, another question from Veronica. Uh, for compost, does all soil really need it? Um, for example, do native, soil, native plants um, need it in local soil? So native plants uh, are adapted extremely well to our environments. However, and typically don't need any additional fertilizer, typically don't need additional soil amend mending. Um, however, the, the trick here is that uh, a lot of times we might live in newer developments where the soil in our garden is actually kind of crummy because it was um, fill that was brought in for new construction or uh, maybe it's a part of the garden where we removed a concrete patio. Uh, so you really have to just kind of judge it for yourselves. It's always recommended before we start a nice uh, big new landscape planting to get your soil tested. And from there you can see, uh, you can also kind of uh, get a sense uh, for yourself if your soil is kind of crummy, it's not really rich, you might consider amending the soil. Uh, however, as I mentioned, uh, native plants, uh, a lot of native plants really thrive in um, nutrient poorer, poorer so soils. So it really kind of depends on the plant. And then with that said, it really depends on how lush you would like your native plant garden to look. So uh, these are good questions for the Native Plant Society specific, uh, and uh, um, and plant specific. So you can ask 
the Native Plant Society specific questions about different species of plants and what their ideal needs are. So, good question. Um, I have one more that I don't know, uh, maybe you have the answer to. Um, are there any rebates in the future for Santa Clara County residents? Oh, or Santa Clara County? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, uh, check out that Basqua website. And there is definitely, um, I, I taught a program last week for Santa Clara County, and they have some really great, it's Valley Water. So go to the Valley Water uh, website and also Basqua to see what is available. But um, Valley Water is actually giving you guys a really great rebate for those larger cisterns. I think it's like a dollar a gallon. I mean, amazing. So Maybe uh, with that, uh, Alameda County might up it. So um, I'm not sure. Anyway, but yeah, check that out. There's every municipality right now throughout California, I'm pretty sure it has some type of awesome rebate in the urban environments. All Do right. we have time for one more quick one or should we move on? Let's move on. I can get it uh, on the next pause. Okay, so now let's get in. We learned a little bit about how to uh, increase the health of the garden, but now let's talk about what we should be doing around our garden right now. And we really want to uh, kind of start to clean our garden up if we haven't already. We wanna cut those big sunflowers down. Uh, we wanna deadhead and cut back any of the perennials, uh, clean up uh, vegetables that, we, uh, that are done or that we're done harvesting or kind of past prime. Remove and uh, remove any dead or damaged branches. Uh, remove any diseased leaves. Get them in the green can. Get them off site if they're diseased, uh, and then get everything else. If you're home composting in a secure compost, <coughs> something I want to share is that as we're moving into the next season. It's important if we have a lot of fruit trees or if we have any trees that have branches that are whips. So uh, we see it with roses sometimes, we see it with fruit trees where a single uh, branch will just grow, just kind of bolt up, it looks like a little whip. It's important just to kind of cut that back. I'm not suggesting that we dive into our fruit tree pruning season, because uh, that really is January, February, but just we want to cut anything back that might be a threat if a big storm were to come through. And what I mean by threat is something that might break or uh, fall on a structure on our property, or break and actually rip off of our tree or shrub, which would actually be kind of detrimental to that plant. So we just wanna do some preliminary uh, pruning for in preparation for our winter pruning season. We also want to go around and clean up the gardens. We want to remove any uh, fallen fruit and nuts. So if we're growing apples right now, specifically we're at the end of the apple season, we wanna make sure all of that is cleaned up. Uh, get Remove any fruit off the trees, even if it was like plums and cherries and apricots, earlier season, let's get them off the trees because uh, these are just going to be sources for uh, pests to overwinter. Uh, specifically with the apples, it's the codling moth. So let's remove these uh, older fruits, get them off site, get them into the green count or get them into our closed compost systems. Um, and then pick up any uh, fruit that's fallen on the ground. And the reason why is because it's an invitation for rats, raccoons, uh, possums, um, deer to come in and nibble. And then it goes the same with our vegetable garden. So many of us are growing more food at home than ever before. And I can share that I, the zucchinis, I call them sneakers. Like all of a sudden there's a day, there's a ginormous zucchini and I'll have a tendency to leave it out there. Well, guess what? The, it's an invitation for rodents and birds to come and nibble. So let's make sure that's cleaned up and we you know, try to avoid these pest problems. The keep in mind when we are trying to avoid urban critters is that we want to remove their food sources. And we could do that by physically removing these fruits and vegetables, or we can also do it in addition by uh, creating barriers, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. And then removing any uh, diseased leaves, as I mentioned before, and getting it off site. And as we move towards our dormant uh, fruit tree pruning season, 
I just like to introduce you to this amazing book that all of us have in the industry, How to Prune Fruit Trees. If you are a novice or an expert fruit tree pruner, uh, this is well, if you're a novice, this is a book you want to have in your library. And if you're an expert, you probably already have this book in your library because this is the go-to book. It's amazing. And it uh, uh, even expands to talk about roses. And then from there, uh, if you'd like more information on fruit tree culture uh, on our residential properties, check out the Dave Wilson Nursery website because they go into some amazing detail about how to grow fruit trees on our properties and why we want to keep them shorter than, um, our, that we're, than what we're used to seeing. And then tools to keep pests out of our homes. Well, this is the excellent time of the year to uh, replace that weather stripping, to uh, make sure our door sweeps are nice and plumb and fit well. Uh, it's also going to keep the heat in and the cool drafts out, but it also keeps crawling insects out. We want to uh, inspect our window frames and make sure that they're all plumb and secure and there's no drafts, because when there's a draft, that means there's also a potential for insects to come in. Uh, a fresh bead of caulk around the window frames, a fresh bead of caulk around countertops, around, um, uh, yeah, cracks and crevices is going to seal out pest problems. And then screening. This is the key for keeping rodents out. So this screening that you see in this picture is called quarter inch hardware cloth. Uh, hardware cloth is a very strange term I know so oftentimes I'll go to a hardware store and I'll ask hey where's your hardware cloth and it's not unusual for the associate to not know what I'm talking about so I've learned just to say hey where is the wire fencing or the poultry wire and then when I go to that department I see all the different rolls of wire mesh this is galvanized and the key here is that rats cannot chew through it Anything else you can think of is going to be something a rat can chew through. We're going to always focus on roof uh, sheet metal, that roof flashing, or quarter inch hardware cloth to keep rodents out. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Other barriers that we can use around the garden, of course, is uh, bird netting, uh, deer netting, gopher baskets, uh, row cover, things like that. Anything where we can prevent them from coming in is going to be a beautiful way to exclude. And then exclusion baskets and frames specifically for squirrels, rats, raccoons. These are all really important tools to implement in the garden. Um, this is this really cool, the photo on the left. It was a bird feeder with this squirrel baffle uh, at a friend's garden. The bird feeder broke. So instead of just throwing the whole thing away. She took advantage of the squirrel baffle, keep squirrels out of the bird feeder, and to put it over her beautiful pot of viola. So that is an excellent way to uh, reuse and to actually prevent. So start to think about how we can prevent these pest problems from uh, messing up our gardens and getting into places where they shouldn't. And then of course these exclusion frames were built, this is the education garden in San Francisco, the garden for the environment, where um, we, uh, they had these exclusion frames built to prevent the rodents from coming in and eating the leafy greens and all the vegetables because yes, the rodents like their leafy greens and high nutrition and their superfoods just as much as we do. And then weeding tools. Here's that uh, picture, an illustration, a little mock-up of sheet mulching. Sheet mulching, have a look. Again, it's those layers, uh, just like lasagna. But weeding tools, this is the way we manage weeds. People always ask me, how do I manage the weeds? And when I say hand pulling, they get really mad. <laughs> no one likes to hear hand pulling. So guess what? I've got some tools here. We've got hula hose, we've got weed whackers, we've got lawn mowers, we've got sheet mulching, and these are all going to help you uh, manage your weeds as much as hand pulling. But these are the best ways to manage weeds when um, the season comes on. Traps, a lot of different types of traps that we uh, utilize for pest problem solving. It's sticky insect traps uh, will help manage and control some pest problems, but I, 
primarily sticky traps are going to be used as monitoring devices to help us identify and see when the pest problems are really uh, happening, help us identify when the threshold is for us to take further action. Yellow jacket traps and fly traps, what I can share about the yellow jacket traps and the fly traps is we want to get them out early. Specifically with yellow jacket traps, we're looking at March. Those first nice warm sunny days in March, we're going to get those yellow jacket traps out because we want to capture the queen. The queen is the only one that overwinters. The rest of the colony comes to its end. The queen is the only one that overwinters and we always see her. She looks like a supersized yellow jacket. She's uh, emerging in those first warm days in March looking for a new place to create a nest. And when we can capture her, thousands of yellow jackets we've just eliminated from our garden. Thousands of yellow jackets we're preventing from growing. So that's why it's so key to capture the queen. And then of course, uh, rat traps, mouse traps, gar uh, gopher uh, traps, and slug and snail traps. We want to invite beneficial insects. As I mentioned, 90% of the bugs are actually good bugs. So these are just a couple uh, photos of bugs that are commonly mistaken as bad bugs and get squished or get um, you know, killed. So understand, recognize, become familiar, familiar with who your good guys are. There's an awesome handout, the 10 most wanted bugs you wanna see in your garden. This is on the Our Water Our World website. Uh, check it out, print it out, you know, post it and um, have a look at it. And the way we attract beneficial insects is by planting a diversity of flowering plants. These flowering plants are going to have a variety of tiny flowers. And the reason why it's because most of our beneficial insects are tiny and they're nectar feeders. Uh, it might be the adult version of the insect specifically might be a pollinator and a nectar feeder where it's the larval form is actually eating the bugs. So when we can invite the adults in, we're going to have the insurance that they're uh, going to raise their young and their young are going to manage our pest problems. So you'll see the top picture is a daisy. Plants that, flowers that look like daisies are like this aster right here. This is a beautiful fall blooming uh, native that is amazing at attracting beneficials. But the daisies, it might look like one flower to us, but those petals are actually rays. And what the flowers are, that yellow button in the center, that's actually hundreds of little tiny flowers that are offering the nectar uh, source and the pollen for our beneficials. And then, of course, the yarrow is a cluster of tiny little flowers. And if you look even more closely, you see those individual flowers are actually very similar to that daisy where it's petals around the tiny flowers. So this is what's so key. So when we want to attract beneficial insects and pollinators, we want to have a variety of these flowering plants and hopefully have them uh, extend the bloom season. So as I have our seasonally appropriate uh, aster in my background. Uh, this is actually providing a lot of nectar. I saw a monarch on it this morning, which I couldn't believe. I think this is the second monarch I've seen this year. So I was really happy. This is pretty much the only thing blooming in my garden right now. Everything else is kind of coming to an end. So there's a lot of variety that you can uh, plant for our climate. And this is just a sample of some of the uh, good guys we want to invite. And as I mentioned, on the top row, these are the adults, the green lacewing, our surfed fly and our ladybug. Now the ladybug is known to also eat aphids, but she's also going to go for a nectar feed. But it's their young, it's the larva right below uh, that are actually strictly only going for the protein meal and really managing the uh, pest insects in our garden. And when we are inviting beneficial insects and trying to cultivate that biodiversity, we want to remember to please reduce pesticides, even the eco-friendlies. Uh, when we're using pesticides, especially the eco-friendlies, we want to understand they're not risk-free. Even insecticidal soap is not risk-free. These are all pesticides designed to kill something. And this goes for your uh, do-it-yourself homemade remedies. When you're trying to kill something, keep in mind, it's now considered a pesticide and we want to be really mindful on how we're using it. So um, I'm a huge advocate for 
uh, using products that were designed uh, for their purpose. So I will um, kind of only talk about or support products that we are purchasing, products that are registered as pesticides. With that, we want to use them as a last resort. We want to always choose less toxic and eco-friendly. We want to always apply the pesticides according to the label. And again, we want to make sure that that pest is on the label. Because remember at the beginning of this program, if we can't identify the pest, it's gonna be really hard to try to manage it. And if that pest isn't on the label, that product's not designed for that pest. We always want to wear PPE. We're familiar with that term these days, uh, making sure that we are wearing long sleeves, non-cotton gloves, long pants, shoes, uh, we're not spraying when there's a breeze more than five miles an hour. Even if there's a breeze that's uh, less than five miles an hour, if it's two miles an hour, that breeze can drift pesticide onto our skin. So make sure we're wearing a mask, wear goggles, wear a hat, protect yourself because we can have uh, dermal reactions to these products even though they're going to be very mild, less toxic, even neem has been known to cause a rash on skin. Take advantage of the dormant season. The dormant season is right around the corner. Once our fruit trees and roses have dropped their leaves, we wanna take advantage doing a preventative spray of horticultural oil for insects and uh, copper fungicides for diseases. Tips for using some products is that when we use our eco-friendly products, sometimes they take longer. So when we put those ant bait stations out, Sometimes it could take about four days. The ants are swarming that bait station, but then after four days, it's just done. Nada, no more. So understand it could take a little longer to work. And timing is important. It's really important to know that that pest is present and that we are using that product according to the labels when the pest is present. Because if the pest isn't present, oftentimes they've already, the damage is done, they've, they're gone. And if we're spraying, it's a waste of time and money. Uh, remember to spot treat. So we might see aphids on our rows, it's important just to spray that rose. Uh, the aphids are not gonna get over onto your kale or over onto your lavender or anywhere else. It's really, the aphids are very specific to the plant that they're on. That's why we see so many different colors of aphids in the garden. There's over 400 different species of aphids in the Bay Area. So they're very plant specific. So when we are spraying, we're just going to spray where we see the problem. We always apply pesticides at dusk. How many of you had that one right? Nice job, because I love it, yeah. The reason why, and sometimes dusk is still too early if it's warm out. Our pollinators are still actively foraging. So uh, we want to give that pesticide enough time to dry. And the reason why we spray late, late, late at dusk is then it has the entire evening to dry and right at sunrise. And then if we have early morning foragers, that pesticide is dry, it's not gonna impact our pollinators. So when we're working with eco-friendlies, understand there are, uh, the reason why they're eco-friendly is because they they don't have residuals that can uh, impair our waterways, impair our environment, or impact our beneficial insects in negative ways. So that's why it's so important to spray at the end of the day. And I always like to go out there after those four o'clock uh, breezes have come through, the four o'clock winds have died down. It's usually around six or seven, really right before sundown. That's the best time. Um, and then uh, if we are working with beneficial insects, if we have released them, give them some time to, you know, get out there and um, manage some of the pest problems. So uh, there you have it, some good tips. And just because I can't help myself, I'm a huge advocate right now on getting uh, chemicals and other household hazardous waste off site because of all of the local fires we've been faced with and because of the seasonal flooding. So what do we do when we've got products we no longer want? We want to take them to our local household hazardous waste. It's free, it's easy, and guess what? Here in Alameda County, we've got four. There's one in Oakland, there's one in Hayward, there's one in Livermore, and there's one in Fremont. Check out the uh, information on stopwaste.org for more information where your local household hazardous waste is. All right, so I'll take a couple of 
questions, maybe just one or two, but I want to dive into the pests. We're about to dive into the pests so that everyone can have uh, the rest of their evening, but I'm getting into the, hi Chris, getting into the, uh, the good part of the program. So do we have anything really quick, Charlotte? Um, we had, a f oh, I'll, a real quick one is, are there aphid traps available? The sticky traps would be considered aphid traps. So aphid traps, uh, if you see them at the store, they're typically those that yellow sticky card that I had an image of, and those are do work for aphids. However, you're not going to, you can't count on controlling your entire population of aphids with a sticky trap. It's really just going to be a monitoring device for you to show you that aphid season is on or that aphid season is over, that you have them or you don't. And if you have them, you're going to want to use a product like insecticidal soap to um, kind of kill them off or blast them off with water. Try blasting with water first. Um, okay, we have lots of uh, questions about specific pests, but we'll keep that to the end. There's one more question about sanitation, I believe. Okay. Um, our passion fruit loaded up with a ton of fruit over the last two weeks. Sounds like we should pull all those out and compost. Um, is that should that is that what Paula should do? Uh, well, if you just are now seeing the passion fruit, so I apologize, I can't remember the season for passion fruit right now. It's been a while since I've um, worked in gardens with passion fruit. So when we are when we have we're working with food in our gardens, we want the key here is to harvest the food when it's ready. Uh, so that it's not hanging around and getting really, really overripe and then attracting other pest problems such as the rodents. So if your food is ripe and ready to harvest, this is the time to harvest it. If it's next month, then next month we're going to monitor and harvest it when it's ready. You know, so it's all going to be seasonally relevant and seasonally appropriate. So uh, the key is just not to have that fruit or those vegetables hanging on throughout the season when they're just like done and rotting and fermenting. We really want to clean up our gardens the best we can. Okay. Okay. I think that's good for now. Thanks, Charlotte. All right. So let's dive into the pest problems. So we really spoke a lot about the ants. So I don't feel like I need to talk about them anymore. However, when we see ants outside trailing up like a fruit tree or trailing up a shrub or a perennial, uh, understand that, that they're our indicator. That's telling us that we have another problem going on. It could be scale insect, it could be thrips, it could be aphids. So if that's the case, we want to thank those ants for pointing that problem out to us and we're going to manage that other problem and then we're going to use some type of sticky banding material that we can remove. We always want to remove it. We don't want to put the sticky paste right on the trunk of the plant. We always want to put it on some type of banding material. It could be uh, like maybe a postcard or sticky packing tape, sticky side out. And then we can manage the ants. That barrier is going to prevent them from doing what they were doing. And then inside the house, of course, we've talked about it and every, well, most of you got it right and everyone's gonna get it right if we ask the question again. We're gonna put those bait stations out. We're gonna seal up cracks and crevices with a fresh bead of caulk. We're going to put new weather stripping around the doors and windows, and we're going to work with the bait stations. Uh, these two bait stations happen to be um, the active ingredient is boric acid and they're in the sugar bait. So very effective, these are the consumer favorites. And then beyond that, since we uh, hear a lot about boric acid and we hear a lot about diatomaceous earth, I'd just like to share the difference between these two. So in the earlier slide, this one here, this is these are liquid boric acid baits. But here, this is powdered boric acid. Powdered boric acid is going to be about the size of a grain of salt and we are going to uh, apply it by putting a little dusting of it, maybe in the frame of a wall or in, behind appliances. We always want to apply it in a way that nothing else can access it other than the insects. We don't want our dogs, our cats, our children to be able to come in contact with that, okay? Uh, and the way it works is crawling insects such as ants and cockroaches walk over it. They groom themselves, they ingest it, and then the boric acid disrupts their stomach, uh, their um, enzymes, and it kills them. 
very effective. And as long as it stays dry, this is a pesticide that can be effective for years to come. And then diatomaceous earth works much differently. It is a very, very fine chalk. Uh, it is crushed diatoms. It is not toxic at all. However, because it's such a fine dust, it's a lung and eye irritant. So we do not want to breathe it. We do not want to get it in our eyes. And again, when we apply it, get it into cracks and crevices, we want to uh, make sure that puppies, cats, dogs, children, nothing else can access it, okay? Because it could get into their nose and cause lung problems. Uh, the way it works, it gets on the skin or the exoskeleton of the insect and it dehydrates them. Works extremely well. And then these are just some traps I just wanted to introduce you to. And though they're uh, uh, targeted for spiders and silverfish or cockroaches, they're just insect traps. They're just sticky traps, just generic sticky traps. And they help us identify if we've managed the problem or if we need to still take action. All right. Here we are, rats and mice. Isn't this the problem that we're all waiting to talk about? It's the problem we talk about every day, right, Charlotte? Every single day we're talking about rats and mice, sadly. Uh, it is the number one pest problem around the greater California, I'd say. Um, keeping rats and mice out of the house. I'm going to be specifically referencing rats. However, this is also going to pertain to mice. We want to, uh, again, make sure the weather stripping around the doors of our house and our garage are, uh, are new and fresh and they haven't been gnawed. We don't want to have any points of entry. We want those door sweeps to fit, uh, fit really tight and plumb. We want to walk around the perimeter of our house. We want to make sure branches have been cut away from our roofs, from our windows, things like that. Understand rats can jump three feet across. So we want to uh, uh, remove those freeways for them, those points of uh, access. We want to see, I have a pencil right here. This is not a traditional number two pencil, but those pencils we all used in school are, um, three eighths of an inch in diameter. And if we can, you know, find a hole that is three eighths of an inch in diameter, I'll share a mouse and a young rat can fit through that hole. So that's why we talk about quarter inch hardware cloth. The quarter inch hardware cloth, quarter inch is smaller than three eighths. And we will walk around our house. We're gonna take those foundation vents off. We're going to cut the hardware cloth to fit behind and put the foundation vent back on. We're going to do the same thing with the attic vents, the chimney flues and the dryer vents. Anywhere where there is a vent, we're going to put quarter inch hardware uh, uh, cloth behind it. If we are in a fire prone area, uh, Cal Fire recommends for those attic vents to use eighth inch hardware cloth because the eighth inch hardware cloth prevents embers from coming in. This is not necessary for your dryer vent or your chimney flue. This is very necessary for your attic vent and possibly your foundation vent. Uh, we want to seal any gaps that we find. And as I mentioned, we do that with the hardware cloth. If we need to fill that gap in, we can use expanding foam or mortar or plaster or whatever. Uh, or we can use that sheet metal roof flashing to cut it and fit it around the pipes that might be coming in and out of the house, like from the um, hot water heater out or that hose bib on the outside of the house. Those are really uh, uh, key points of entry for rodents, easy access. So if we can cut that sheet metal around and uh, secure it, it'll prevent them from getting out. And then pet food. Uh, so many people have a tendency to feed their pets outside, keep the bowls full of pet food, kibble all day long, or feed feral cats. Well, this is an invitation for rodents. So we want to remove those sources. And if we are feeding the feral cats, well, um, you know, those kitties are smart. It, we can really narrow it down to just 15 minutes a day. If they know they're going to get fed at 10 a.m., they're going to show up at 10 a.m. So uh, we really want to make sure we're avoiding uh, feeding the rodents. Working with traps are going to be the most effective way. 
to manage a, a rodent infestation. Uh, rodents are very suspicious of new things. So we want to first bait the traps before we set them. So baiting the traps, uh, getting them used to feeding off of them before we set it with the electric traps, that means just not putting the batteries in yet. And getting them familiar with a bait that they're actually going to go for. Sometimes I find mice are fussier than rats. It could take a couple days to find a bait they'll go for. But uh, think about chewy, nutty, salty, sweet. I'm a huge fan of a chewy granola bar or something similar to a Fig Newton. Or bait the traps with what they're already going, they're already eating. Are they getting into the kitty kibble or the dog kibble? Bait the traps with that. Uh, um, rats are specifically, um, they really love little meat sticks. So a little piece of a Slim Jim would also work. And then once they've fed off that trap for about four times, now we can set the trap and now we'll have success. But uh, once we start to set live traps, just like we would in our garden with gophers or moles, we want to start to monitor those traps and make sure we're removing the death immediately. With rats and mice in the house, we want to then put that death into a sealed bag and get it into the garbage. We don't want to just dump it into the garbage or dump it in the green can. That's not where it goes. We need to put it in a sealed bag into the garbage. All right. And then around the garden, uh, we want to remove those places of harborage. So those big patches of ground cover, that could be where they're living and that could be a problem. We want to uh, prevent them from getting in our compost systems. We want to prevent them from getting into our chicken coops. And the way we do that is we secure them again with that quarter inch hardware cloth, floor, walls, and roof or lid of the compost is with a quarter inch hardware cloth and then it's gonna be sealed. Um, and then keeping lid on the garbage cans is also going to be ideal for other uh, critters such as our raccoons, reduce that pet food availability as I mentioned really consider um, not putting up for bird feeders. I know this is a tough one for a lot of us bird lovers, but that's another you know vector for um, problems. The seed drops and the rodents are just there to sweep it up. And then um, remove their food sources. Something I can share is that there's a phenomenon around the Bay Area that rodents really like to chew the bark off of our trees, specifically citrus, when the winter comes on so strange. So we want to try to avoid that. We're going to create a barrier of quarter inch hardware cloth or some type of tree wrap around the bark to prevent the rodents from chewing. And we're going to go back to looking at these exclusion cages. So if we've got uh, vegetables growing in our garden and rodents are getting to them, then we're going to want to put up some type of fencing, right? Uh, if we've got the fencing could be around the entire vegetable bed or it could just be over raised beds as seen in these photos here. Gophers, we're going to plant everything in a gopher basket or we will line our raised beds with half inch hardware cloth. And if we are living in areas where we've got super crummy clay soil, we're just probably going to give in and just plant things in raised beds anyway. So, but if we're doing that, make sure it's lined with half inch hardware cloth to prevent the gophers from coming in as well. Proper identification is key because this time of year, we have a lot of misidentification between gophers and moles. Gophers create mounds that are shaped more like a crescent. We are going to get more information on how to set gopher traps from the UCIPM website. Uh, they also on UCIPM have videos on how to set the traps, how to identify active tunnels and so forth. And then for moles, you see here is what a mole mound looks like. It looks more like a volcano. Uh, really moles are just eating the larva of insects that are in the turf or in the soil. So I see them as beneficial. And really, all you have to do is rake this mound and it'll be flat again. Their damage is much different than gopher damage. It's less aggressive or less of a uh, nuisance. However, 
They can certainly do damage to a beautiful turf lawn. So if that's the case, we want to remove their food source. And their food source are, as I mentioned, grubs and other soil dwelling larvae. So we can apply beneficial nematodes. Beneficial nematodes feed on soil dwelling larvae. We can also apply repellents. The repellents made with castor oil are the only ones that I know of that are effective. So make sure castor oil is the active ingredient. Read the label. There's very specific instructions. But what I found is by a couple applications of the castor oil, it's going to prevent these soil dwelling uh, critters for quite a while, almost a year. I see the activity for moles in my property and one area has just started and the, it's the last time I applied the castor oil uh, was November and we just started seeing activity in September. For, so almost a year, very effective. So for other urban critters like raccoons and squirrels, really challenging because uh, they're tenacious, they're smart, they can get around. So let's remove their food sources. Uh, use exclusion whenever possible. If the raccoons are digging up your lawns, let's put some poultry wire down to prevent them from digging up the lawn. Um, and by all means, please do not feed the wildlife. We do not want to encourage squirrels. We do not want to put that cat food out to feed the raccoons. And just to share, it is against the California Code of Regulations to feed the wildlife. Um, and yes, there are some repellents on the market. However, they're not going to work as well as um, some of the other, like for the gophers and moles. But if you are going to try to use a repellent for raccoons and squirrels, you can try this Have a Heart product. Over the years, I've found that people have had some success, minimal success. So just keep that in mind. And then the last pest we're going to talk about before we jump into your questions is snails and slugs. Because as the rainy seasons come, so do the snails and slugs. So if we are going to handpick them, uh, make sure you wear gloves. And I will walk around with a bucket of soapy water and I'll just drop them in that soapy water. Or I'll go and throw them into the chicken coop. Or I'll throw them into the lane or the street. Uh, I really have very uh, little tolerance for slugs and snails, they're gross. But uh, snail boards are very effective. It's actually a, a wooden board that is on like maybe a one by two riser. Uh, so it's almost like a little raised mini stepping board. And then what happens is slugs and snails do not like the heat of the day. So they will take coverage, uh, shelter underneath this board. And then you can lift the board up and literally scrape all the slugs and snails into it. Uh, gross into that soapy water. Uh, we can use products like Sluggo, which is the iron phosphate, which is the active ingredient. This is a product that um, binds the guts of the slugs and snails. It is not toxic. It is not toxic to um, the birds, to wildlife, to our pets. However, if your dog gets into a bag of the Sluggo, then you certainly want to go to the vet because they can. Um, you know, have some type of a digestion problem, but it is not a toxic pesticide. Um, and again, remember using that chunky mulch uh, helps as a barrier and watering early in the morning so that the plants can really dry out so that uh, will also prevent the slugs and snails. All right, uh, in close, here's just a reminder to go to the Our Water Our World website to find all those nifty things we talked about. And then I'd like to, for those of you that have to sign off, I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you have any other questions that come up, you can find me at my website, which is plantharmony.org. You can also find a list of future events, future classes that we'll be teaching, and then also uh, some pest tips that I write as well that are just little and brief, and they get sent out about once to four times a month. You can sign up to receive those. But enough about that. Charlotte, what questions do we have? Okay, um, we got two questions about ground squirrels. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for controlling ground squirrels? Squirrels, ground squirrels are really, ground squirrels. really, <laughs> yeah, really challenging. Um, there are traps available. Um, the ground squirrels, you know, maybe Charlotte, you can look it up really quick while I'm talking, but I know there are some squirrels are protected because they're indigenous and other squirrels are not. Um, so just keep that in mind what, what I'm saying. So you'll have to apply that and maybe Charlotte will get us our answer. But um, 
There are traps on the market, so you can trap the squirrels. However, uh, the California code through fish and wildlife is that when you trap on site, you have to euthanize on site. And the ways that we euthanize are very specific. We're not allowed to torture the animal, which means we can't drown it. In um, incorporated areas, residential areas, we're not allowed to use firearms. We're only allowed to use firearms in unincorporated areas, so that's not very many of us. So it's really tricky to uh, find ways that would properly manage the squirrels. So, however, I do know that ground squirrels are a big problem in the um, southern part of Alameda County and kind of southeastern part. Charlotte, do you have anything to add? Um, sorry. Um, I know. Tell Chris it's not bothering you. No, there's a plane flying over my oh house. Oh my gosh. That, like, it felt like it was right over my house. Oh my um, gosh. Anyway, sorry, it, look, my brief Google search seems to show that they are, ground squirrels are native to California, but they are not protected. Okay. And I can share the ground, ground squirrel management pest note from UCIPM in the chat. That would be really helpful. I do apologize. I feel like uh, squirrels are, I know they're really challenging. I don't feel that there's a lot of good answers I can provide but it is always nice to have a good resource. And I do know that um, the UC um, pest note goes into some length about it. Good luck, I know it's horrible. What's the next question? Okay, and then I got um, a few questions about rats. Uh, one climbing into papaya trees, one climbing into orange, orange trees, and then also on the same note, um, protecting bananas from birds so they're all kind okay. of I don't know if there's one in the same or yeah no that's really good so when we have trees now a citrus or a papaya might be challenging because sometimes they're multi-trunk and maybe they'll be tall enough that you can do this citrus sometimes have a tendency to be squat and dense but if we can get that roof flashing that I mentioned before roof flashing is typically about 18 inches. And if we can wrap it around the trunk of the plants, trunk of the fruit trees, or if it's a multi-trunk and we can wrap it around the multiple trunks that continue to extend, rats are not able to jump up that 18 inches. Now, if these plants are against a fence line or they're next to another plant that the rats can just jump over to access, then that's not going to do anyone any good. Uh, so that's the problem is that um, not easy. Now there is a product on the market by IV Organics. It's IV, like the um, numeral, uh, Roman numeral number four. So it looks like you know, four, but it's IV Organics. And I know they sell the product around at um, like Dale, Ace, and Friedmont. Um, I think they have it at Laurel Ace. Um, check out some of your local hardware stores and, um, and the garden centers. They might have it at Alden Lane, I can't remember. But IV Organics is a repellent that I have been hearing it works really well. My aunt has used it actually in Berkeley on her citrus. She said it worked very well. She sprayed it on around um, the branches and it prevented the rodents from coming. So it's something to try. As far as um, the birds accessing specifically, you know, like the bananas or other fruit, there's a way you can build a structure around the tree to then uh, secure bird netting um, or wire, you know, uh, depending on the size of the bird, you could be just working with poultry wire, which is easy to work with. Then that's what you'll have to do. It sounds really crazy. I know, but these, this is what we have to, uh, these are, this is our management strategies. If we want to enjoy the fruit that we're trying to grow, we need to exclude the squirrels and the birds and the rats from getting to it. And it's not always easy. 
And that's why I referenced the um, Dave Wilson website. Let's start to look for plants that are going to uh, be smaller. We want to also prune them to be shorter. So this is why we can harvest the fruit with ease and also manage them with ease. Uh, I know that there are uh, smaller varieties of bananas out there. However, um, most likely you probably have this the traditional one that we grow readily in the Bay Area that gets kind of tall. So, um, yeah can't it's tough if we've got other plants around the area they'll just access it that way so kind of tough okay um a different kind of question where can you get your soil tested oh great question um you know charlotte or do you mind giving us your email address so that we can email you that list uh off the top of my head I can't remember who I recommend, but there are some uh, resources in the Bay Area. Um, let me see if I can look it up really quick, or maybe Charlotte, you can. Um, they're down there in San Jose. Um, I know. Oh gosh, I just will have to look that up. Okay, I no. asked the person to send us their email. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I believe it's the same person also asks, I had an apple tree that died from coddling moth over 10 years ago. Now the shoots from it are coming up all over, including through the bricks that form the floor of my patio. Is there any way to stop it? That's really strange. Um, and I think it's strange that it would have died from coddling moth because coddling moth just really affects the fruit and not the tree itself. So that's curious to me. However, uh, those whips are coming up from, uh, or the suckers are coming up from the, uh, the root growth. If there's a way to remove the crown. Um, that would be, you know, the stump. If it's still there, you'd bought, it would be ideal to get that removed. And you can do that with like a stump grinder, or if it's a small enough stump, you can do it with an ax, like a pickaxe. And then anything that's coming up between like the bricks and patio area, um, if you can just break those, you don't want to cut them. You want to break them. And the reason why is cutting them just will stimulate more growth. Whereas if we break it, it physically stops that uh, stem from wanting to grow. Um, not always easy to do though. Uh, the reason why we want to do that is because it's going to prevent photosynthesizing. And then when we prevent photosynthesizing, the plant gets weaker. And then over time, it will just hopefully not be an issue anymore. You can also, after you break it, uh, pour boiling water over that open tissue and that will also um, kill it off. Okay, um, we have a couple more. So tell me when we should, if we should stop, but I can keep going. <laughs> um, yeah. How can you tell the difference of a mole and a rat or a mouse burrow? Moles are going to have that volcano as we as showed before, and they're shallow tunnelers. They're really tunneling under the surface about six inches. Mice, well, let me go back. I know it's not too far if you guys don't mind. They have this very clear, this is a, right here, this is a vole or field mouse hole, very clean. There's multiple holes usually in an area and uh, really just putting uh, one of those traditional wooden victor traps, not baited, just set it and put it right in front of that hole. As they're running out, they'll get snapped. Then we can identify what that is. And it's typically a vole or a field mouse. Rats, their burrowing system is going to be a lot more intricate. It, um, and it's usually kind of larger. So like we might have those passive uh, wood pi or uh, debris piles in our garden. Oftentimes they'll be burrowing in there or they'll be living in brick, like a pile of brick or um, again, the ground cover. If you suspect you have a um, rat um, family on your property, you can reach out to a couple really awesome pest management companies such as Pest Tech. Pest tech is really cool. Um, you can, they will come in and evaluate the situation and offer less toxic, effective, sustainable pest solutions. So they are, they specialize in integrated pest management, which means they're going to solve the problem 
uh, with a less toxic approach, but they're going to solve the problem. It's not a band-aid. They're not just going to just put out some bait stations and just hope for the best. They're actually going to tell you and help you manage that problem. Okay. Al says, perfect. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, squirrels get into my plant beds and mess with my succulents, arugula, and spinach plants. Should I worry about them spreading diseases? Well, I would just probably not want them to get into my um, garden beds. So again, getting some um, fencing material and with squirrels, it could be poultry wire. It doesn't have to be that hardware cloth. And um, you can um, just, you know, build a really easy structure with uh, one by ones or one by twos, and then just staple that poultry wire on. And the good news is also really lightweight. These, these, these exclusion baskets or exclusion cages are very lightweight, so they're easy to move around. Okay, great. And I think this might be our last question. Um, Veronica was just looking for a little bit more information about dormant sprays. Um, just maybe repeating what you said or expanding a little bit on it. Yeah, excellent. So dormant sprays are one of the only times we actually use a pesticide as a preventative. Typically, pesticides are not used as preventatives. We don't spray just because. So, uh, however, with the dormant spray, we are going to take advantage of the dormant season, which is when leaves have dropped from the trees or from the roses. And if we had a pest problem the year before, such as if we had a peach leaf curl, which most of us do because we live um, in California, uh, especially on the western side of the state, it has tends to have moist cool springs. If we had a situation where there was excessive woolly apple aphid, uh, if there was a situation where we had just excessive aphids like on our roses, then, and excessive I mean more than normal, uh, then we want to take advantage of the dormant season. Um, the dormant season, we would be spraying a pesticide at a stronger mixing rate. It's called a dormant rate. That means it would be phytotoxic to the leaves if we were to spray this mixing rate, the stronger mixing rate on during the growing season. Typically the product is diluted more for a growing, for the growing season. So the dormant uh, spray is gonna be a, a more dense, more concentrated uh, application. And what it does specifically, the horticultural oil is going to coat any insects that are overwintering and um, in theory suffocate them. Uh, coddling moths are not always going to be um, managed well in this fashion. Oftentimes the dormant spray, the horticultural oil is not strong enough to um, kill them off over the winter. So that's just the reason why I said it should uh, suffocate, but it doesn't always. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, with uh, when we apply like a copper fungicide, such as a copper soap fungicide or liquid cop by Monterey, they are going to, this is going to manage any diseases. So if we have like shot hole fungus, um, any type of black spot that is, you know, there's an assortment of uh, diseases, leaf diseases, fun, uh, leaf funguses that we see on fruit trees, on roses, like black spot and rust. Uh, we can spray, spray the copper um, fungicide and it will kill any spores that are overwintering. Um, the thing is, is peaches, peach leaf curl is uh, a prominent uh, fungal disease here in the Bay Area. And so, Instead of just spraying once, we're going to want to spray up to three times. So typically for that, we would start as early as Thanksgiving, then New Year's, and then as late as Valentine's Day. But we really want to try to keep on the schedule of about every six weeks, get three, sp uh, three sprays in during this time frame. Once the, uh, we start to see buds swell in the spring, and the minute we see those buds crack with color of the petal, the flower petal, dormant season is over. So we are not able to spray dormant, um, a dormant spray any longer. We will then, we need to spray any more. It would have to be an in-season mixing rate, which would be more diluted than what you have been applying. The cool thing about dormant sprays is that, as I mentioned, it is a preventative. It will uh, reduce those uh, first 
populations of aphids, so it kind of gives us a jump start. It reduces those fungal problems that we see if we happen to have a rainy spring. And we are using less pesticide because there are no leaves, so there's less surface area. So it really is an awesome way to take advantage of uh, using a minimal amount of pesticide in a very effective way. Um, just one follow up to that. Dorm are dormant sprays systemic? Did you? Sorry if you just covered that. They are not systemic. They are going okay. to be topicals that are going to uh, coat and suffocate the disease or insect. Okay. And then actually, one question just came in What's the best solution for leaf miners? Leaf miners, are they on citrus or on vegetables? I. Uh, you could let us know that, that would be really helpful. On citrus. Citrus, okay, because it's two different uh, management tactics. So leaf miners on citrus, um, well, typically we put up sticky traps for indicators. And that sticky trap is going to be ideally yellow and blue. So yellow one side, blue on the other. Um, and, or you can go and purchase a leaf miner sticky trap, but again, sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're blue. We are going to, um, I think there's a sticky trap specifically for citrus leaf miner. And, um, is that, is that right? Do we see those? I think that's right. Anyway, I'm having a, some, a brain fade. Uh, Leaf miners, we start to see their little tiny eggs that are going to be on the underside of the leaves. Those eggs will hatch. The larva will burrow between the two layers, the outer layers of the leaf, uh, enjoying all the succulent juices within the leaf. Uh, you can see the larva. If you see it, you can actually smush it between the two layers of the leaf. It's kind of gross. And then it emerges as a very, very tiny little moth. She's really pretty. She's kind of frilly. Uh, the thing is, is that Pesticides are challenging. So there's a lot of products out there like horticulture oil or insecticidal soap, uh, pyrethrins, which is a botanical, py uh, which is the good pyrethrin, not the synthetic pyrethroid, which is highly toxic to our waterways, but the botanical pyrethrin is a very effective, strong pesticide. You'll see in products like Takedown or in um, three-in-ones by Ortho or Bonide, things like that or Safer's Yard and Garden. Um, we can spray these products, but the trick is, is that citrus are typically really dense. Uh, there's a lot of dense growth. It's really hard to get into that uh, citrus bush or tree and to do a nice thorough spray underneath the leaves where the leaf miner eggs are. So not always easy to get to. There is a product called um, Spinosad or Spinosad. It's by um, Monterey Insect Complete Disease Control or by Bonide called Captain Jacks. You can apply that. And the cool thing about it is that it has some sublaminate qualities where it absorbs into the leaf. And with that, it, will, um, it is a product that has to be ingested by the larva. And so because it can absorb into the leaf, it, it gets to the place where the larva is because those other products I talked about before this were just contact kills and we're only going to be killing the eggs, not the larva. Because once the larva is between those la uh, layers, it's protected. But the spinosad actually has a, a capability to absorb and then that larva can access, access that pesticide. It's effective, however, again, um, it's really hard to get a nice coating around your tree. The other thing with spinosad is that it has on the label, you're only allowed to spray it six times a year. And with that said, um, we have to, our timing is really crucial and it's really challenging to identify that challenge, uh, that timing. Um, the good news is, is that leaf miner is just unsightly. It's only affecting the leaves. It's not affecting our fruit. And, uh, we want to prune it. The timing for the pruning is important. We want to prune our citrus trees really at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall with enough time for new growth to flush before frost. 
So wherever you are, you want to kind of uh, understand where those first frost dates are and then count backwards and to make sure that you have enough time for that new flush to grow without being uh, and harden off enough so it won't be affected by uh, frost. Or be mindful that frost could be coming and cover your citrus with frost blankets to protect that new growth. We could send you some more information on uh, citrus leaf miner, or you can also go to the UCIPM website and read the pest note on a citrus leaf miner. I dropped that in the chat, actually. Awesome. So I think that's it. Okay. Well, gosh, for all of you that are still hanging around, thank you. We went a little longer. This is actually much longer than normal. I really appreciate all of the great questions, all of your time and attention. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out if you've got more questions. I'm always here to support you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And Charlotte, thank you so much for helping and being such a wonderful assistant today and a great facilitator. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you, um, Alameda Clean Water Program. Have a great evening, everyone. Enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Charlotte.